All right, so I'm so happy today to welcome Professor Catherine Carpenter. Um, Professor Carpenter uh, is visiting us from Los Angeles, uh, where she teaches at Southwestern Law School. Um, I'm going to do a little formal introduction because she has lots and lots of credentials, which I'll, I'll try to go through quickly um, before I get to the fun stuff. Um, Professor Carpenter is a member of the American Law Institute. She's a nationally renowned criminal law scholar in the area of sex crimes and sex offense registration. Um, her scholarship has been cited by numerous courts and used as a guide by attorneys. Um, she is also one of the foremost authorities on law school curricula and accreditation. And I'm so happy uh, Mary, Mac Mary Macchiarola is with us today. Um, Professor Carpenter knows Mary very well and worked with our former president, Dr. Macchiarola, on law school accreditation. So she has a very special relationship with St. Francis College. And so we're so happy that you're joining us today. Um, and uh, so some of my colleagues and students know that my research is in the area of sex offense um, laws and policy. And I got to know Professor Carpenter. She wrote an amazing, amazing article um, that has been cited far and wide, including by many, many courts, um, about juvenile sex offense registration. And what is the article that is now being used in Doe v. Snyder? Uh, uh, the evolution of unconstitutionality. Okay, the evolution of the unconstitutionality of sex offense laws. Um, she is a very, very uh, important expert and scholar in this field, and it's such an honor to have her here from Los Angeles. Um, I just want to make two housekeeping announcements. Next week, we'll be back in our regular room, 3213, with journalist Debbie Nathan and um, students that are here with Dr. Lowry Kinberg and Dr. Devlin. At the end, you will go back to your room, but we will announce that at the end. So sit tight. Um, I'm so happy to welcome you to St. Francis today. Thank you so much for coming. And I know you're going to love her talk. She's a wonderful, wonderful speaker. Thank you, Catherine. Okay, thank you. Well, my, my thanks to Dr. Horowitz for inviting me to talk to all of you today. And before I go any further, I have to do really a warm personal welcome to Mary Macurola. Um, it is special for me to be at St. Francis, and I'm really hoping that Dr. Macurola, that Frank is looking down and smiling and saying, I finally got you to St. Francis. Um, we worked together very closely for several years on American Bar Association activities and law school accreditation. And there was one period of time where he and I shared a team together to go inspect a law school. He, for those students who didn't know him, he was both larger than life, a teddy bear, warm, personable. And the thing that I remember most about him in all of his walks of life is he loved St. Francis. He called all of his students his kids. And he would talk about his kids every time we met, not just his own kids, but his St. Francis Francis kids. So Frank, this one is really for you and I'm really delighted uh, to be here. I want to talk about a topic that um, may be uh, something that most people don't talk about. It may be something that you're not familiar with or it may be something that you've come in to hear with some preconceived ideas about it. So what I want to talk about is really about kids, juveniles, who have to register on the registry as sex offenders for convictions that they had adjudicated as juveniles. And the way I want to start with this is I want to ask all of you a question. And the question that I want to ask is, I want you to imagine that you are held accountable for the rest of your life for something you did at 10 years old. So you stole a candy bar when you were in third grade. And the letter T for thief is attached to your name for the rest of your life. You go to high school, there's the letter T. You go to college, there's the letter T. Or you cheated on a fifth grade math test, and a big fat C sits next to your name. You come to St. Francis, and there's the C next to your name. And nobody looks at what you're doing now. They only remember the letter C. And in, a, in essence, that's what's happening for kids on the registry. That's also what's happening for adults on the registry. And my scholarship really involves both adult registration and kids on the registry. Today I want to talk primarily about kids on the registry. But when I say the word sex offender or sex offense registration laws, I have a sense of what pops up in some people's minds. And I get it. And I want to put that out there sort of right now. This is what pops up in most people's minds. What pops up are these faces. These are probably the most 
horrific images that we may have of people who have committed uh, horrendous uh, sex crimes. Jerry Sandusky, Penn State coach, Second Mile Charity uh, founder, uh, where he was convicted of 10 child rapes and molestations, and he's serving time in prison now in Pennsylvania for it. John Evander Cooey uh, lived behind the Lunsford home in a trailer. He kidnapped nine-year-old Jessica Lunsford, raped her, and murdered her. Horrible, horrible story. He was living right behind their house. Horrible story. Philip Garrido, some of you may know that name or may know that story. He kidnapped on the street 11-year-old J.C. Dugart. She was on her way to catch a bus. Her stepdad is watching her get onto this bus, and this car pulls up, and Philip Garrido takes her. Held her for 17 years. Held her for 17 years. She produced a child. If you saw the room, which won Academy Awards, there is a lot of truth, although it wasn't based upon that story. There's a lot of truth to that. And finally, the original, not original original, but the original poster child of this all, Jesse Temendiquis, who lived across the street from seven-year-old Megan Kanka. And he lured her to his home with talk of a puppy, and he killed her in his home. This is who a lot of people think about, and I get that. But that's not what the registry looks like. The registry is packed with other people, and that's who I want to talk about today. It's packed with other people. There's 861,000 people on the registry nationwide. That's a lot of souls. That's a lot of people. Only maybe 8 to 10 percent of them are the dangerous kind that I showed you before. The vast majority aren't that at all. In fact, the overwhelming face of registration, the overwhelming face of registration is nonviolent and it's non-reoffending. That they aren't Phil Garrido, they aren't Jesse Temenguquez. They've been convicted of pretty minor sex offenses and then they've spiraled down into what is a pretty unjust system. And approximately 20% of that registry is filled with kids. Kids who committed an act at 10 years old or 12 years old or 14 years old whose lives are ruined because of that act. And that's really what I want to talk about. So I want you to look at who some of these people on the registry are. And when we talk about sex offense registration laws, I hope you'll think about these guys, these people, not just the boogeyman in the bushes, but these people. So the first one is the 18-year-old who sexts with a 16-year-old girlfriend. I know everybody in this room knows what sexting is. You're not doing it, but you know what it is. So they call it self-produced, self-published child pornography. If you're sexting with a minor, that is child pornography, subject to a huge prison sentence, and for many, subject to lifetime registration for doing that. 18-year-old with a 16-year-old, and everybody's consensual here. This is not the Anthony Weiner case. This is not the case where all of a sudden, on your phone, shows up an image you weren't expecting. These are kids imaging each other. That's on the registry. Very common one on the registry is the 19-year-old who has consensual sex with a 15-year-old girlfriend. Consensual sexual activity. We could have a discussion about, okay, should 15-year-olds be having sex or not? I ask it in my class often, so I'm going to ask, actually ask the poll here. Every state has a law called statutory rape. Every state has a law that says, even if you're consenting to sexual activity, sexual intercourse, Below a certain age, we think it's not right, and so we're going to presume it's not consented to. So I want to poll, first of all, how many of you think there should be a law called statutory rape of some kind where below a certain age, you shouldn't be having sex? Do I have any takers? All right. But below a certain age. I guess the question would be what the age is. I think in New York, it's 17. In California, it's 18 years old. That's pretty high. The average age is 16. Would anybody vote for a law that's for 12? I mean, takers for 12 years old? So 12 years old, over 12, you'd be fine if it's consensual sexual activity. Anybody for 14? Over 14? Okay. Yeah. So what I'm finding is on the college campus, the age is younger. In my law school class, I can get everybody to about 16 years old with not a lot of people below 14 or 12. But here's the deal. It's all consensual. 
and they have to register for 20 years. And I want to mention one kid's name who actually made national news. You might remember the story. His name is Zach Anderson. Zach lived in Indiana, hooked up online with a girl in Michigan, just 20 miles across the border. So Zach went across to Michigan to be with her. She's 17. Michigan is 17. That's great. It's consensual sexual activity. It's legal. He goes across. Oops, she lied. She's not 17. She's 14 years old. Zach is convicted of statutory rape even though his mental state was not to commit a crime. He thought she was 17. She looks 17. He was convicted of statutory rape. Had to register, allegedly, for 25 years. A lot of big press about him. His parents fought for him. Uh, we have in the audience Bill Dobbs, who's very connected with the whole advocacy movement, and Bill Dobbs worked hard on that case as well to bring it to the public to light. My favorite weird story is about Dean Edgar Weishart. Look at the last category. So here he is, it's 1979. That was the rage of skinny dipping and streaking. And so he skinny dipped in a Hilton Hotel pool, 1979. Ha ha ha, no big deal. He signs a little ticket, yeah, 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 and decent exposure. Goes back home, 1995, 1996, knock on his door. You know, we know that you have an offense here. You're gonna have to register as a sex offender. He goes, that's exactly right, what? I have to register as a sex offender? You gotta be kidding me. 1999, the laws changed. Now he had to register for life as a sex offender in that state. No due process, no ability to say, excuse me, I skinny dipped in a pool with my girlfriend in 1979. So when you think of the word sex offense registration laws, I want you to think about Dean Edgar Wysot. I want you to think about people who engage in consensual sexual activity around the country who end up on this merry-go-round loop that we call registration laws. And now I want you to look at the kids who are on the registry. 15-year-old boy has sexual intercourse with his girlfriend. Now I'm old, so I'm gonna put the word girlfriend in quotes. She's 13 years old, they are in love, they think it's all terrific, so they're having sexual intercourse. He has to register for 20 years for that act of sexual intercourse when he was 15. The one on the screen on the bottom, 10-year-old girl, you may have seen this article. It was just written up in the New Yorker. Her name is Leah Dubuque. I don't usually say the names of children. Uh, we keep it private and confidential. Children who are in juvenile court, we want it to be confidential. But she outed herself. She ran a blog on what it is like to be that kid who goes to college, who's in high school on the registry. So here's the deal about her. She's 10 years old. She's got a seven-year-old stepbrother and a five-year-old stepbrother. I think step is probably the operative word here. She starts to dry hump, simulate, simulate sexual activity with them. They're all clothed with her seven-year-old brother and her five-year-old stepbrother. You know the effect of that? She was removed from the home. She's 10 years old, was removed from the home, was placed in a residential placement, and what followed was like the C for cheat, like the T for thief has followed her through college, through her after college years, all because of something she did at 10 years old. This can't be fair. This can't be right. Have to figure out legally how to get us to a place where we can get rid of it, but it can't be fair. The next one happened just in your neighboring state. It's New Jersey. Two eighth grade boys did a really stupid, brutal prank. And I'm gonna call it a prank. They pulled down their own pants and sat on the faces of two sixth grade boys. And be, okay, dumb, right, bad, ugly. We can all see the picture and we don't like it. Okay, so here's what happens. They do that, the New Jersey court calls it a sexual assault, and they have to register for the rest of their lives until they're 80 years old, until they're 90 years old for this act. Not only do they have to do that, I'm not making it up, the court sanctioned it goes to court and the court says, well, you did the sexual assault. And in our jurisdiction, that kind of a sexual assault makes you have to register as a sex offender for life. And look at the labels that follow them. Words matter. Words really matter. And the minute we hyped our dialogue, the minute we changed the rhetoric, and now the words are stamped, 
We have the 15-year-old boy who had sexual intercourse voluntarily. He's called a sexually violent offender in his state. That little pin in Megan's law calls him a sexually violent, uh, violent offender. And you have no idea that all he did was have sex with his 13-year-old girlfriend. The two eighth grade boys, they're called sexual predators. Now, sexual predator is what you might think Jerry Sandusky is but not the two 14-year-old boys who did what some guys do in locker rooms around the country. That's kind of crazy. And Leah Dubuque, a sexual abuser. And that's what they call her for having done that crime when she was 10 years old. So we talk about registration. Is it burdensome to be a registrant? Most of us in this room have no idea what it's like, all the rules and regulations. And I start with a silly story about me. I'm Canadian. So I come from Montreal, I've lived in America for a very long time, and in the first 20 years I lived in America, I had a postcard I had to fill out. I had to register as an alien, and I would drop it in the mail. And so some people would see the word register as this very benign, nothing term, just drop the postcard in the mail. What's the big deal? It is such a huge deal. In the state of Alabama, there is 115 ways 115 things you have to do regularly to register. And that means 115 ways that you can violate your terms and get sent back to prison as a felony. 115 different ways. I defy anybody to live five years under those kind of rules and make it that long. So I wanna show you some of what's required. When you register, name, address, photograph, fingerprints, email, driver's license, all that stuff. Biological specimen that sits. You have to report a change of any address and your intent to move. If you forget to report immediately within that three days or five days, that could be a felony and you go back to prison for it. You have to consent to search your computer at all time. Remember, that's the 15-year-old who has sex with the 13-year-old. That's the 18-year-old who was sexting pictures with his 16-year-old girlfriend. No social networking at all. You guys have a smartphone? Of course you have a smartphone. You're on the internet? Of course you're on the internet. Can you imagine going the next 20 years without social networking, without being able to have a smartphone? No Halloween participation. That's a big brouhaha around the country. There are a lot of states. Uh, we have stamped it out in California. Like every time some uh, county tries to stop it or tries to say we want to put sex offender on somebody's front lawn, we've been able to crack down on that. But a lot of states think that's a, a good way to out people who are sitting in there. Failure to register is a felony. And I want you to look at the other things. Look at the residency restrictions. You can't live within certain distances of schools, daycare centers, or places where minors congregate. That means bus stop, movie theaters, malls. Are you seeing the picture? You can't live almost anywhere in a city. We've ended up with a huge homeless population because they have nowhere to go. All because 90% of them peed in public, maybe did something non-contact offense, didn't, didn't rape a child. They are sitting having to do this. And now some states have come up with what they call presence restrictions. Forget about living in a place. You're not allowed to move through that town may not be anywhere where children will congregate. I mentioned Zach Anderson, the kid who went over from Indiana to Michigan. Let me tell you a few of his requirements. He couldn't speak to anybody under the age of 17 for the next five years, ever, except his family. Those are the only, he could talk to his brothers, but he couldn't speak to anybody else. Now, you may have people who are 16 years old that you don't care for and don't want to talk to them, but there may be others you want to talk to, can't speak to anybody. He couldn't go to a restaurant that serves alcohol. He can't stay out after 8 o'clock at night. He had to drop his computer science major because he's not allowed to be on the computer. Feeling crazy? Yeah? Are you surprised by these restrictions? Yes? Yeah. I'm not making it up. I'm not exaggerating it. In fact, when you talk to folks who are deeply impacted, who are registered, they will tell you that their list is a mile long of the things that they have to do. And remember the kicker, if you violate, you're back to prison for not anything to do related to a sex offense. So look at the juvenile. 
They can't go to malls. And if they're going to go to a mall, they've got to tell their parole officer. They've got to tell a probation person, I'm going to go to the mall. They have to pick a time. They have to go in. Okay, I'm going to go to the Gap. I'm just going to buy my clothes. Can't own a smartphone. Can't work on a computer. Can't go to the movies. All because? All because of some act that doesn't warrant this. Notification. You all know Megan's Law. Anybody ever looked on Megan's Law? I want to see in my neighborhood. Anyone done it? Yeah? Yes? I think most people have. Yeah? When you look on it, you see a bunch of red dots. Doesn't, you have no idea what this means, all those red dots. Do you feel more scared or do you feel safer? Do you go, oh my God, it's too many people to wash over me. This is everything that has to happen on Megan's Law. Everything goes up there. People are outed. They're not outed for their burglaries. You have a murderer living next door to you. You have no idea you have a murderer living next door to you. But they're outed for that sex offense. So look at everything that's up there. And we've seen adults and children targeted because they've been outed, where there are groups who go around, take screenshots of people who have committed these offenses, and plaster it on board everybody. Now, one might think it makes us safer. OK, you might be thinking, no, there's a reason I want Megan's Law. I understand that feeling. I get that feeling. But I have to tell you, it doesn't make us safer. All the literature tells us it does not make us safer. All the evidence points to the fact it's a placebo. It's a false sense of security for nothing. And it's costing us tons of money to do this at the expense of schools, at the expense of roads, at the expense of other things. We are creating a cottage industry that's costing so much money. And I promise you, there's no bang for that buck except incredible devastation in the lives of these people. Kids who are on the registry report that on a daily basis they want to kill themselves. And you can imagine why. They can't live at home. They don't have educational opportunities. They want to kill themselves. That can't be the way we should be doing this. There's got to be something wrong about that. So who are these kid offenders? Two groups. They tend to be the voluntary criminal sexual activity statutory rape, sexting, uh, voluntary activity. And they tend to be also coercive violent acts. Kids on the registry include those who fondled without consent underage people, who did press themselves on people, absolutely. And that's the group I want to talk about right now. This group who commit coercive or violent acts. There are on the registry those who do that. Why are we putting them on the registry for life? Why are we putting on the, on the registry for so long? I have a thought. I have an idea. There is a feeling among us that once a sex offender, always a sex offender. If you did something at 10, Leah Dubuc, with your five-year-old stepbrother, guess what? We think you're going to do it again when you're an adult. That's what's really hidden in all of this. I call it the Dexter effect. Did you ever watch the show Dexter? So Dexter is a good serial killer. If we can put the word good and serial killer together, he's a good serial killer killing other killers. Dexter, at two years old, at three years old, was, had been traumatized, and then he was started to kill little animals and butterflies, pull the wings off of them, and he started to do really ugly things. And then there is a thought, and there is some psychology, I don't know if it's true, some psychology that says, you know what, if you show that violent tendency when you're a kid, you might actually become violent as an adult. That tendency may stay with you, and maybe you might murder as an adult. I don't know about that. There might be truth. There is no truth to that when it comes to sex offenses. Just because a kid did something as a child does not mean there is absolutely zero evidence to suggest they're going to do it as an adult. The Dexter. It's the Dexter effect. Here's why. We have this mantra. It's a sticky message. Sex offenders recidivate at a rate that's frightening and high. I mean, you've probably heard it. Oh, I know the recidivism rate is so high, it's through the roof. That's why we have to have this registry. All the social science, all the empirical evidence tells us it's not true. And if you have no other takeaway from this lecture, I hope when you walk out and people maybe mention it, I hope you think to yourself, hmm, the empirical evidence doesn't support this grand phrase that it's frightening and high. It really isn't frightening and high. In fact, in fact, 
here's what it actually is. And there are numerous studies, sociologists, Dr. Horowitz writes about this, we both write about those empirical studies. It's hard to tell, but adult sex offense re Reoffense is maybe between 5% and 15%. I got to tell you, burglary is much higher than that. 5 to 15%. And for my kiddos, for child offenders, it's 1%. For 1%, we're putting them on a registry. And the biggest kicker, it substantially reduces over time. By 30 years old, if a child offender by 30 years old hasn't reoffended, they're never going to reoffend again. So why do we have them on the registry forever? What's the value of that? That doesn't make any sense. Even for adults, we know that at year 16, if they haven't reoffended, they're not going to reoffend. It's a lot for nothing. It's a lot for nothing. So all of our states that have tier, tier three offenders, they're called the most dangerous, got to stay on the registry for life. It's not true. There's no reason for that at all. So who are these kids? The top one are future predators. Tiniest percent, maybe 1% of that 20% might actually end up growing up to be the predator you're worried about. Most aren't that at all. Here's what they are. There's a wonderful professor at Berkeley, Frank Zimmering, who does nothing but work with kids. Most, most were sexually abused and are acting it out for a transitory period of time. What they say in the literature is if you've been victimized, either you remain a victim or you try to conquer that victimization by becoming the aggressor, that that's the dance that goes on. And there is a boy, he's now a man, Josh Gravens, who is nine years old, who sexually, he sexually fondled his six-year-old sister. Nobody knew at the time he had been repeatedly raped by neighborhood boys. He was acting that out. And what started in that ended up in a whole spiral down for Josh Gravens, who again has outed himself about it. Some are naive experimenters, um, people who think of themselves as little kids. So they're more grown up, but they're comfortable around children. And so they have low impulse control. And so this is what they are doing. They don't deserve this idea that they're always going to be uh, committing sex offenses. Then there's juvenile delinquents. These are our guys who just perform all kinds of crimes. So they commit drug crimes, they commit burglaries, and oh, by the way, they also do sex crimes. This is not the person who's the boogeyman in the bushes. And then finally, can I just say, some are actually just playing doctor. You know that phrase, playing doctor? Well, that's been wiped out of our vocabulary. There's no such thing as playing doctor anymore. Two six-year-olds, it's not playing doctor. In fact, I have to out this DA. There's a DA in Michigan who threatened to charge went after a six-year-old boy. Why? Because he was playing butt doctor with a six-year-old girl. That's what they called it. It was called butt doctor. And she charged him with a sex crime. Six-year-olds. We can never start too early, she said, in sending out that message. No, I actually think we can start too early. I really think that's a wrong statement. Of course we could start too early. So, because I'm a law professor, I just want to leave very quickly with an idea. You're going to be hearing more in the news about this. The way to stop all of this legally is for us legally to think about these laws as punishment. Right now, they're thought about like you got a driver's license, like administrative regulations, like you have to follow with the DMV. But when you think about how bad they are, when you think about how onerous the burdens are, it doesn't feel like getting a driver's license with the DMV. It feels like punishment. It feels like a burden. And so what's going through the courts now is they're wrestling with this idea. Do you think these laws feel like punishment? So let me ask all of you, do these laws feel like punishment or do they feel like a driver's license? Do they feel like punishment to you? Yeah, yeah. So many of you, maybe some of you say, well, Professor Carpenter, I think they feel like punishment, but I don't mind punishing these people. That could be true, too. But do you think they feel like punishment? That's what the United States Supreme Court potentially is going to hear this term. They're actually going to think about whether this looks like punishment. And so I want to just, with one last slide, talk about why I think it's punishment, and then open it up. Uh, I have the movie and then open it up for questions. 
So I want you to look at this list. Maybe it's punishment if it feels like you've banished people from the, the state, just like they did in colonial times, like old England times. If you feel like that, it's punishment. If it's public shaming, like the stockades, it's punishment. If there's humiliation attached to it, it's punishment. So I want you to look at that list. Basically, people are banished from cities. You can't live or work or travel in many cities in this country. Look at the internet registry. The humiliation and shame that follows for those kids on the registry, for adults too, on the registry. And then the last one, you got to meet a lot of mandatory conditions. This looks and feels to me like punishment. And so a number of us write scholarly articles designed to keep talking about that. But even as we write the scholarly articles, even as we do that, we want to reach out to all of you. Because maybe if walking away you say, OK, I still think sex offender registration laws work. They're good. They're important. But maybe I walk away with a takeaway that maybe they have to change. Or maybe you walk away with a takeaway that says, boy, these are bad. They're too much money, not worth it. We should get rid of them, which is another way to look at it. In either way, I think they shouldn't stay the way that they are. Um, so advocacy is my passion. Teaching is my real passion. And on the side, I write scholarly articles. And this is what I'm fighting for now. All of you in this room are going to find your own passion. You're going to find something that you, maybe you already have it, something that you care really deeply about, that you want to work on. Maybe you feel like you're alone on it. Maybe you're trying to find a group with it. So what I want to do is talk to you about how you create a movement. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute, you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit. But you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in.
So I'm not sure who the shirtless dancing guy is, if it's Dr. Horowitz or me or Bill Dobbs or another group of people, but creating the movement that we have coming together from across the country helps to nurture what we're doing. Think about in your own lives, if you see that shirtless guy and you think, well, I don't want to be the first one up. But sometimes it's great to be the first one up because others will follow with you. It has been a pleasure. I'm happy to take questions if you have any. I don't know, Dr. Horace, if you have any last thoughts. Uh, no, I would love to. Question is, OK, so you want to take the people with petty crimes off the registry, but Jerry Sandusky you don't want off the registry. So I have a couple of responses to that. I suppose what I would prefer, my personal preference, is to eliminate the registry and make prison sentences long. So prison sentences long. So if we're going to have a registry, then yes, Jerry Sandusky would stay on the registry. But Jerry Sandusky may never see the light of day. He may end up staying in prison for a very long time. Now, there is a debate in, um, in circles about how long sentencing should be and whether there's value to it. And we were talking ahead of time. Do you think Anthony Weiner should go to prison for 21 months? Yeah. There. Yes. All right. There we go. So when you just said yes, there's, I think, two things that I heard in there. The first was what we call a principle of retribution, that he's blameworthy. He did something knowing the free, he had free choice. He knew it was against the law, and he did it. We call that retribution. And maybe there's a few of you that thought about deterrence. You said, I got to punish him so that others aren't doing the same thing. And that would be a principle of deterrence to send him to prison. But there may be others in the room that say, what is the value of locking him up? for that offense. He's not going to be a danger. Take away his phones, right? Take away his ability to be on the internet. Why lock him up? But that would be, I think, a great question, and that would be the answer. If we're going to have a registry, it would be for maybe a very small group. In fact, I will tell you, when registration first started in 1994, the number of offenses that were registrable, that's what we call it, that were registrable, were only eight. Eight. Now, there are 45 in each state. So all we've done is add more and more and more. I think you might be comfortable if it went back to eight tiny offenses, right? Big, large, aggravated, horrible crimes. Yeah. So uh, it's a great question. The question is, what we're talking about the two boys who held them down. And there's a concern that it does portend future violence, kind of aggressiveness. Plus, are we thinking about the victims? Because I didn't talk about the children who might be affected. And that child was deeply affected. So I, I don't disagree with you. I don't disagree with you that uh, there may be a violent tendency there. I'm not sure that registration on a sex offender registry, on sex offense registry, is the appropriate tool for dealing with that violent tendency, if there is one. I don't disagree with you that that's something to watch. It is a battery. That's definitely something to watch, but I'm not sure that we're addressing it the right way. Just because we have a tool doesn't mean we should fill it with all these people. That would be my response to it. Yes, the question, question is for the front of the room that might not have heard it. This felt like bullying. It was bullying. It's power exertion over two younger and probably smaller children. Absolutely it was bullying, whether you use words or using physical action. The minute it became a sexual bullying, now all of a sudden this whole other apparatus kicked in that we don't do for other kinds of bullying. So, the, and I liked your last line, kids do stupid things. Nobody in this room has ever done anything stupid, but I'll confess I've done stupid things. Am I still being uh, recorded? I hope not. Anyway, we've all done stupid things as kids. I don't want it to track me or follow me. Um, so the question for those who could not hear it is, who's defining what's sexual? When you start talking about children 9, 10, and 11, are they really aware of that whole uh, sexual nature of it? And then I liked your example, boys are always doing those kinds of things, right? Sticking their butts in other people's faces. I don't know about the gender distinction there, but yes. So this is, a, this is the real problem. In fact, in one article, I went through some of the discussions that um, school officials have with the children. And what you find out is they ask very leading questions, leading questions that are very sexual leading questions. And the nine or 10 year old doesn't have a clue what's being asked. So they're like nodding dumbly. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, no, no, this nine or 10 year old wasn't thinking that. There's a terrible story of an 11 year old girl. Now she is older than the six year olds. And this is what made that story out, taken out of playing doctor, although I think she really was playing doctor. She's 11, but she was younger than her 11-year-old years, and she is experimenting, showing her private parts, looking at their private parts to six-year-old boys. 
she was caught up in exactly that. And I'm not sure she appreciated or understood. In fact, Leah Dubuque writes in her journal, she didn't have a clue what she was doing at 10 years old. She had seen it someplace, I can't remember where. I think if you see a 10 year old simulating a sex act, we have to turn and look at the family. What's going on that the 10 year old is actually doing something like that? So for the last decade, I've written about this. And in fact, several of these articles have been cited by the Supreme Courts of different states. And lawyers and the ACLU are using my legal argument, which I didn't really talk about here, but the legal arguments to try to change uh, sex offender, sex offense registry laws, uh, either for adults or for kids. The second one down, I was privileged to be asked by Dr. Horowitz and her co-author, co-editor, to uh, devote a book chapter to a book that they've written um, on autism and its impact on the registry. This is just a really recent discussion. What we're learning is that people with intellectual developmental disabilities are very vulnerable to these crimes, either because they have poor impulse control or they are socially naive experimenters, and very often they get caught up in either uh, molestation of younger children or in possession of child pornography. And so this book chapter is that. Um, the 2012 article that Dr. Horowitz mentioned is the one that's been cited by uh, a number of courts and was used as the basis for um, an argument that went up through the federal circuits and might be going to the United States Supreme Court on whether these laws are punishment. Yes. So then under this idea that at 13 you know right from wrong on a man and woman, then I would imagine that you would be against uh, children at 11 or 12 or 10 who are put on public registries because they didn't know what they were doing was wrong. Yeah. The question is, and you've been talking about this over-criminalization, it's not just sex offenses. There's zero tolerance for anything in schools, right? You bring an aspirin as a kid, you get suspended. Inside your backpack may have been a plastic knife from something. There's zero tolerance for weapons, even though you didn't know it. We have lost judgment. The other thing that's happened, and I call it legislative sound bites, Every time you get into an election cycle, all you hear about is this idea of more criminal laws, more criminal laws. Everybody wants to vote for more criminal laws. And what we end up looking at is this huge, where we've come from. I have a colleague who calls it a huge haystack with only a few dangerous needles in it. So whether it's registration laws or the overcriminalization of all kinds of laws, enough's enough, right? And you know what? If, even if you thought that was true, our pocketbooks can't handle it. We don't have the money to warehouse all these people. We are warehousing people at the risk of so many other things that we should be devoting our attention to, not to mention generations of people that lose out and their families lose out because of our warehousing them. So I agree with you, Professor. You're talking to the choir there. So the question is, what is their period of time on the registry? Every state deals with it differently. There are a few that are kind of at least saner than others where they don't make it public. It's a private registry where only law enforcement knows, so you or I wouldn't know their names. But many it's public, and then it depends on the offense. For some it's 10 years. If it's a low offense, that's still 10 years. Some it's 20 years or 25, and then some it's for lifetime. So part of it's triggered by the offense that they've committed. Not the age. Not the age, no. In fact, and I think about it, there's an appellate court, ridiculous, an appellate court peering over the bench basically like this, who says to this 11-year-old, I know it may seem harsh that you're gonna have to register for the rest of your life, but this is what the law is. I don't know how, how an appellate court could actually say that in good conscience to an 11-year-old who virtually is standing in front of the court. Yes, so there is this thought in residential placement because they get removed from the home that there is, uh, but there's varying degrees of success and varying degrees on whether it actually does what it's intended to do. Because even if it works inside, then think about it this way, Mary. They come out, they can't go to college, they can't get jobs, they can't live at home, they can't live in neighborhoods. What are you sending them out to? What kind of a life? So the depression hits, the anxiety hits, and again, they struggle with suicide. So the question is, why do I think we've ended up where we are, this public registry and this dehumanization of a subset of, of people? Um, I think that, and sociologists, I think, confirm that we are in the throes of an irrational societal panic over this topic. 
there's three elements to a societal panic, a moral panic. The first is that there's an official reaction that's the same, that everybody talks about in exactly the same terms. It's frightening and high. Everybody recidivates. All the judges, all the courts are using the same language. That politicians have emotionally charged rhetoric. And I'm sure if you look around, whether it's in New York or other states, you will hear really vitriolic kind of expressions that dehumanize uh, people who've been convicted of sex offenses. And then third, it's the media that fans the flames. Not only the media has newspaper articles, but how many of you watch SVU? Law and Order SVU? Yeah, me too. I watch it all the time, and I watch Law and Order. But I'm here to tell you, Law and Order SVU is probably one of the biggest culprits in terms of the whole world of the world of a sex offense. So we have those three things, and when you look and see what's going on around us, but here I will end with hopefulness. I am hopeful. I'm hopeful that change is coming. I'm hopeful that this horrible tipping point that Malcolm Gladwell talks about that happens around in just phenomenons is actually shifting. We're starting to see articles in newspapers that actually are now humanizing the registrant, making them actually, making us aware of the devastation that they feel. That's good. We have courts that are brave enough now to say, guess what? I think this is punishment. I don't care. You can call it a DMV license. Uh-uh. This is punishment. So I'm hopeful that more courts will do it. I'm hopeful that all of you, when you walk away, will think about this in a broader context, not just the way the emotionally charged rhetoric thinks about it. So I'm hopeful for that. And I'm hopeful that the courts are going to come back and continue to say that. And maybe it gets to where it's a registry that's small. I think your question's a good one. Or maybe we eliminate the registry and think of other ways to keep us safe. All right, and with that, I'll say thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.